very much. Um, it's, it's not a question of um, if you ask questions, it's a, it's a question of when um, you ask questions. We, there isn't an, a, a particularly set structure for this discussion, and I know there are, I can see various faces in the audience who will definitely have um, some important insights that I would like to share. So um, at any point, if uh, something said which you um, have some input for or have some violent objection to, uh, just put your hand up and we'll come, we'll come straight to you. Um, and that's sort of from the word go, okay. Um, thanks, Julie. I'm, I'm Ian Reeves. I, I used to edit Press Gazette. And I was actually on the way here, I was, I was re remembering a piece that I wrote, a cover story that I wrote in 2004, I think, um, for Press Gazette. And um, it was, the headline was, I have seen the future and we're not in it. <laughs> um, which at the time, and it was based on, it was, it was based around various things that were doing the rounds at the time. I think um, Philip Mayer had just made his, what became a sort of fairly famed, uh, slightly misquoted prediction about the last date of, that the New York Times would publish. And he'd, pr he'd predicted, he'd made a, a sort of an economically based prediction. And he came up with a date of 2041. October 2043. 2043, thank you, Roy. Okay. Um, I've got it in my diary ready. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And, um, and there was all, you know, the, the rise of the blogosphere and, and, and citizen journalism and, and all of that. And at the time, I remember thinking, you know, this and, and um, we'd done some great uh, illustrations of pickled notebooks in dusty glass jars. And, but I remember at the time thinking, you know, this is all a bit slightly over-egged and, and far-fetched. Um, fast forward five years. Um, a very tumultuous five years, and suddenly 2043 seems a very long time away to me. <laughs> um, things have taken a rather, you know, even more dramatic lurch um, southward, certainly for the printed media than um, than even you know were being predicted by greater analysts than the likes of me back then. Um, so. We're kind of gathered here today to assess the um, assess the health of this um, patient called the regional newspaper industry. Um, and fortunately, we we only have 60 minutes to uh, to conduct our operation. But fortunately, we have the great greatest surgeons and uh, physicians surrounding us um, to assist. And um, I shall just be passing the scalpel around, really, and the forceps. Um, so I'll start, I think perhaps as good doctors should, um, we need to, to, to make a start by trying to work out just how poorly the patient is um, and have a look at some of the symptoms. So I'm going to go around the panel um, to start with just for some brief thoughts on, on how bad they think it is from, from their experience. Um, I'll introduce them one by one um, and um, we'll sort of move it on from there. Um, I'll start with John Slattery so immediately to my right. Um, John, uh, former deputy editor at Press Gazette uh, for many years, um, cut his teeth on the Lincolnshire Echo, mm -hmm. I think I'm right in saying, um, and now runs um, a very well um, thought and thought of uh, blog um, about um, journalism. So John, can you give us your view? I heard you on File on Four the other day on Radio Four talking about the perfect storm um, that uh, is the engulfing. Which is the perfect, industry. perfect cliche. <laughs> the perfect cliche. Perfect cliche. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how, sick, how sick is a patient? Yes. Um, well, I'd say that in the 20 odd years that I covered the newspaper industry when I worked for Press Gazette, I'd never seen uh, anything on this scale in terms of redundancies. I'd never seen 900 journalists lose their job in, jobs in something like six or seven months. I think that's unprecedented. Um, just a couple of stories that ha have happened in the last six months that I think show how bad things are. Um, I think when you get a situation um, like you did at NewsQuest in York where the weekly editor and the daily editor and the managing director are all made redundant and had to compete for one job, I'd say that's fairly unprecedented. Um, a couple of years ago I judged the uh, reporter of the year in the regional press awards and three of the top um, people on the shortlist were from the Manchester Evening News. Um, all really good stories, all very experienced reporters. 
Um, and there, they're losing 39 journalists out of 90, which means nearly half the staff on you know, one of the most well-known regional papers. And I think that shows the scale of what people are facing. OK. Thank you. That's slightly gloomy then. Yes. Um, I'm going to turn to Keith. Um, Keith Sutton um, is uh, known to uh, those of us in the, in the uh, uh, regional newspaper who cover the regional newspaper industry as the guy who was always on the stage collecting regional newspaper of the year. Um, to, it's a slightly monotonous <laughs> and uh, rather tediously <laughs> regular manner. Um, he was um, editor and editor in chief of various newspapers in Ca uh, Cumbria, where I think he still lives. Um, but his uh, career goes way back before then. He, he, he was editor of the Wapping Post, short lived News on Sunday, um, the Northwest Evening Man in, in um, Barrow. Um, and he's currently a member of the NUJ's local media commission, more of which later. Um, can I remind you of something that you said to me at a Society of Editors conference about five years ago, um, which was, and I re remember it quite clearly, you'd said at the time, if the, the, the big problem is if the, if the regional evening newspaper didn't exist, you wouldn't invent it. Is that still, I might be misquoting you, but that's what my, my memory of what you said. Is that still true? Is that part of the problem? Well, I think, I think it belonged to the days of racing results and test matches where you got news at half past four, um, real news, as it happened two hours ago. That, w that was the reason for buying it. But I think um, you, have to make a, you have to differentiate between regional and local, and even between local and ultra-local. If you're, you know, there are several patients, and some of them are doing better than others. <laughs> um, I totally agree. The regional uh, are in, in dire straits, as we know. All the big metropolitan papers, uh, and those which claim to cover like one of the pa one of the papers that I uh, first started on in Cumbria was then called the Northwest Evening Mail, a grandiose title, um, and uh, that went out of business in 19. Uh, 1968 and became more and more just the Barrow Mail, and so it dwindled. And I think that what's happened elsewhere is it's sort of it used to go from Lancashire to Scot to the Scottish border. But that's uh, you know now you've got you've got small communities that can sustain a local paper. You've got papers like Sir Ray Tyndall's um, um, extraordinary group. I don't know how many he's got now, but. They sell, you know, 800 to 2,000 copies each, and he's the original Mr. McCorber. He <laughs> makes, you know, a penny profit out of each of them. But if you add them all up, he makes eight million a year. And um, I don't think he's made many redundant. Uh, many redundant. He may have to. I don't think he's made any redundant. Don't think he's made any redundancy. So, you know, that model. Um, that has, there may be a message for us in that. And, and wherever he's got papers, he's got definite. Um, discrete communities, whereas papers like the Northern Echo, the Western Mail, Northwest Evening Mail, I don't know quite what their role is. They, they fall between two stalls, so, and I think they've, they're in a bad way. Um, but the local papers, the ultra-local papers, uh, whether it be in print or online, I think have a future. Right. OK. So we can take some comfort then so from, uh, from some of those I words, so. I think. Yeah. There is a heartbeat, mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to turn to William um, Yarker. William is um, a director in Deloitte's media consulting practice. Um, 13 years at Deloitte, I believe, nine in media, in the partic the sort of particular media division. Um, he has um, consulted for and, and uh, done various um, projects for pretty much uh, most of the big brand newspaper groups. Um, as far as I can work out. He can't go into too much detail about some of those uh, projects, but he um, w has a lot, uh, will have a lot to say about the, some of the, the, the bigger picture stuff. Um, I'm just going to pick out the w one quote from um, a, report, a, a report that uh, you put out last month, I think, um, William. Uh, particularly, uh, this was particularly with, uh, concerning uh, regional ownership yep. uh, rules. Um, but one quote that stood out for me, which said, 
with the right business approach, local newspapers can flourish. So that that does seem to have a kind of positive yep. spin on it. Yep. Um, is that out of context, that quote, or...? or I think it, it, it's it's to try and G everyone up for a start, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, that, yeah, there wouldn't be any, any point sort of di discussing this and let us all go home. Um, I think... I think one of the reasons I was invited here is, is we have, uh, we, as Deloitte, we've uh, conducted a, a survey and we, we do an annual survey on uh, media consumption habits and some of the findings of that were actually quite uh, encouraging. Um, now, how we actually get those into, into a business model that, that, that preserves that sort of journalistic uh, input that we need, uh, I'm not sure about we can discuss later, but some of the findings that might be interesting are um, 81 percent of people who uh, access the internet on a weekly basis uh, actually look for regional information and regional news during their, their surfing time. In terms of uh, the consumption of news, uh, 71 percent of, of respondents said, and, and this was an online survey so it's sort of slightly skewed towards online people, uh, 71 percent of them said actually I prefer to read things in hard copy uh, and the hard copy is the the way that, that actually these companies can still make money, because we haven't quite cracked, cracked the online side yet, or some have. Um, and the other one that was uh, that actually in terms of the advertising, uh, it's 56% uh, of respondents said that uh, the uh, newspaper adverts had uh, a much higher effect than uh, the uh, internet online adverts that they saw, uh, that, that they saw very much as uh, intrusive to their, their viewing pleasure. So. Not, not great hooray, we'll all say, but there are a couple of, of nuggets in there to say, well, actually, if we can work out how to uh, flex our business models to, to invest in the content, which is why people want to, want to consume, uh, then I think there is, there is a future. Okay, right. Some more glimmer of, glimmers, of, glimmers of hope. Um, I'll finally turn to, um, to Roy Greenslade, who, um, who almost needs no introduction, but I shall just give him a very short one anyway. Um, uh, a sort of bestrode Fle Fleet Street for many years, um, editor of the Daily Mirror, um, and uh, now professor of journalism at City University, and uh, perhaps best known for writing a um, lively blog <laughs> about media matters on the Guardian's um, website. Um, Roy. To, uh, <coughs> to continue your analogy about us being a medical team, I think I'd be the Harold Shipman. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I don't want to rain on the parade uh, too much, but uh, let's get some reality. Um, the first thing is that there is a massive financial crisis. Uh, let's not, you know, the, the, f the business models of these newspaper enterprises are wrecked. Not just the large corporations, which do have debt problems, do have big pension problems, but also small places because operating cost problems are there because advertising revenue has plunged. And if you read anything that the advertising industry, so-called, says, it is that advertising will not return to newsprint at the same level as it's disappeared. And I don't want to be rude about surveys, but you know, 71% of people might say that they like to read newspapers, but the buggers don't buy it. <laughs> because the other crisis is that we have a crisis of readership. When I was a, a, a young and rebellious and difficult sub on the Evening Argus in Brighton, we sold 105,000. It now sells barely 29,000. That's not, you know, that's 71% of the people in Brighton are not responding to that survey. And 56% may say they want to read adverts in papers, but the buggers are watching Grumtree and Friday Ad and Craigslist, and they're not consuming it. Clearly, that's where people are going. So, uh, you know, I don't, I, as I said, I don't want to rain on the parade. Let's get it right. There is a crisis. Now, some people will tell you that, and, and by the way, let's take on board what Keith said, because he's quite right. The greatest crisis is in the metropolitan uh, regional dailies. That's a huge crisis. So I think those papers are uh, dead in the water um, fairly soon. And hyperlocal and local papers are doing much better. And some of them are doing, in fact, jolly well. And some of them, indeed, 
given the right opportunities, could turn a profit again and could turn a, you know, a healthy profit. And if you read Dan Saber in the Times the other week, he was saying that in fact many of them are still making money now. Not enough, but they are making money so they could be resuscitated. And we might think that there definitely is some market at least for local journalism in the future if the owners, if the current owners can actually make it work and can enough I invest enough in, in, in both platforms. In other words, to continue the print brand enough to carry it over. Um, I'll stop there because, you know, I'll, I'll take up the hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so uh, <coughs> some, some very gloomy news, some glimmers of hope. Green shoots. Green shoots, oh dear. <laughs> oh dear, you said, it, you said it. Green slades, green shoots. Um, um, so I, I, I thought, you know, maybe the, the next the, the next step is given, you know, there is clearly a, a, a very real crisis, and, and that some of the, the numbers that, that John was quoting there, um, particularly about the disappearance of jobs in journalism, which, by all accounts, will not return. I think that the, the next question that we should turn our attention to as, as a medical team is, is this patient worth saving? Why is a flourishing regional newspaper in the industry, or any regional newspaper industry, um, and taking on board what you say about the, 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 you know, the different levels of that um, um, industry, why is it valuable and why is it worth saving? So can I go back in the same order? And yeah, well, send that? Uh, I, th I think the thing about the local press is, is that it is a voice for opposition, even though people might think it, their local paper is rather conservative or a bit dull or whatever. I think that is the place that people go to. Um, and I think it's often <laughs> um, dissenting councillors from, from the ruling group, it's the opposition, but that is the place that you go. And I think it's very important as well that it does um, contain a variety of news so that you could buy or, or get my local paper to read about Arsenal and you'll read on the front page like you would do this week <coughs> that some councillors are charging a thousand pounds in expenses um, to chair committees. And I think that that broad approach you know, actually is the watchdog role. It is keeping an eye on what's going on and mo most importantly that if that disappears, I don't see it being replaced. I can see it fragmenting. I can see there might be an Arsenal website and there might be a website for people who are obsessed with local government, but I don't think it'll ever come together. And I also think the strength in numbers. I think, you know, if you have a, a newspaper that's uh, reasonably well staffed, it's got more clout, and then it can stand up to um, the authorities that are employing a lot of ex journalists to spin. And, um, I think it would, it's, it's a major loss. I mean, I keep seeing stuff where people are saying, oh, well, you know, it's just like trawlermen and miners, you know, disappearing. It's just one of those things, you know, well, why should journalists be any different? Well, my argument would be that you can still buy fish and you can still buy coal, but if you lose your local paper, I don't think necessarily anything will replace that. Okay, thanks, John. Um, so I'll turn to you, Keith, and, and you know, perhaps if you should take up on that. O obviously, y your experience as, a, as a, an editor um, will give you the, perhaps the greatest insight for on this panel on, on what difference uh, t uh, titles like that can make to a community. But then perhaps you could also take John's point, d does it actually matter if, you know, if, if, if the fragments into these small communities and, and you've got your Arsenal fans and your <coughs> local government geeks in their separate community, d does it matter that they're not being brought together under the same roof? I think, I think um, the value of the local paper is mainly as a s as collector of the minutiae of social history. I think it's a social role more than a political role. There is a, there is a political um, watchdog role, but I think we can get slightly carried away with that. Um, you know, I mean, local democracy has its problems already, and they're massive. You know, you've only got to look at the turnout at elections, centralization of, uh, of government, and, and the, you know, the, the, the withdrawal of, of local authority powers has got far more to do with the failures of local democracy than I think the, exist the, the existence of the local paper. The local paper is, in essence, part of the local power structure. Most of them are, anyway. There are a few community papers like Leeds Other Paper, Press Another Paper, the Wapping Post, the Peckham Jenny, all of them that have rippled over the last sort of 20 years and disappeared. But the vast majority of local papers are part of the local establishment. And as editor uh, in Carlisle, 
um, it would be it would be unwise for me sometimes to to take on um, the whole of the uh, power structure locally. If I had the police on side, if I had the hospital on side, if I had the schools on side, if I had the football club on side, those are the real power structures, and you could then move things along. But I think the main concern is it's losing its value as a social as a collector of social history. And in particular, all the archives and the, 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 that are behind those titles, which have not yet been digitalized. And um, uh, one, of, um, one of my favorite ideas that I've heard of lately would be to get some sort of state-funded backing for the digitalization of all the local papers. I mean, it's happened, you know, the Times and I think the Guardian go back now many, many years. The same should happen locally. And I think just one more point on what I'm saying about local titles. They are as much owned by the readers locally, by the community, as they are by um, passing owners. They're a bit like football clubs to that extent. Um, and the, you know, if we are going to see massive closures on the scale uh, uh, as in the States, and it looks as though we are probably going to, of lots and lots of local and sub-regional and regional papers, then maybe somebody should do something about saving their, 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 uh, their titles, their brands. They are valuable, and they shouldn't be allowed to sync with the company that's failed to keep them afloat. They should, they should be free for someone else to take on board, because some of the problems of starting a local paper is you start from nowhere with no brand, and I think that's an important uh, consideration. Can I, can I just ask you uh, one thing I, th I thought you might say? Um, but, but, you know, I recall the, the, um, the particularly the, the foot and mouth outbreak, and uh, I think it was floods as well. I uh, yeah. seem to remember you, it was ca catastrophe. Everything but bar famine in Carlisle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but there was there was <coughs> there seemed to be a sense that the paper was where everybody yeah. came, and, and it you know th th there was a very important function. So there is a, yeah, there's a definite role. I, I admitted <coughs> that. Yeah, that as a you know as a, as a defender of the of a champion of the local area against central central state central government. Um, they can be, you know, newspapers are on their own. And, and certainly during, um, uh, during the foot and mouth outbreak, I mean, without doubt, we helped get rid of Nick Brown, rightly or wrongly, as agricultural minister, um, because of his handling of the crisis. Um, Tony Blair was whisked up to Carlisle, elections were put off. Um, I, I had access to, to the Guardian pages to write pieces um, as editor of the local paper. Uh, we had appearances on Channel 4. So with the aid of other media, I suppose, national, we, we did make a national impact um, on behalf. And, and, and yes, that, that's a very important strand of what a local paper can do. OK. I'll just turn to you again, William. Um, I, I'll ask you the, you know, the same broad mm. question, and then perhaps add a slightly unfair question. But in your, in your role as con a consultant and, and talking to people particularly about the the, you know, the, the, the structure of, bus yep. of the business and, yep. the, and the, the financial side. Do you get the sense that, um, that those people that you are talking to at that level of those businesses understand and, and value the journalism? Or do they purely look at it as a, as a, uh, as a, you know, a, a business thing mm. that they have to work out a way to make some money <coughs> and pay and some investors? Yeah, uh, you are right. That is an unfair <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, at, at, when you're talking at, at very senior levels, money is you know, a, a very major part. I mean, the way uh, that, that you normally have discussions around it is you need to make money for the long term. You should be looking for, for stewardship of you know, some of these titles and what have you. Um, the, the people that, that, that I've been talking to, they do have background in journalism, but there are lots of commercial people there. So I'm trying to skirt around <laughs> that question as far as possible. OK. But as a, as a reader and an observer mm. of, uh, of, of um, local media, yep. do, do you have a you know, personal sense that it's something that's, that should be valued and traded? Of course it should. Of course it should. I mean, it's, it, it, it's interesting looking at it, sort of talking to various colleagues and, and, and some people earlier, that that local brand is is really important a for the the trust and independence it brings but also just as a, a as an aggregator of local information that is important um you know, you know where to go to find certain things out 
from a, from a, a, a local uh, advertiser's perspective, with the fragmentation of, of sort of the media channels out there, it is one place that actually you know you can advertise and, and, and reach your local audience rather than actually buying Google AdWords or what have you. So there is a, there is a, a quite a strong uh, commercial glue as well as a, a sort of social glue there. Yeah, yeah. Can I just interrupt just for a second just because I've remembered something about um, the police in Devon and Cornwall are actually starting to report courts themselves because the local paper has failed to do so. Um, because they want to show the community that things do happen, that people do have sentences passed against them. And the other important point about the police and, and the court system, which needs to be covered by reporters, is that you know, if you don't have a local paper telling you exactly what's going on locally, you, all you get is the Daily Mail, which is going to, which is going to pick up the most extraordinary um, lapse sentencing for burglars or whatever, you know, they're going to say, you know, burglar gets two days in, in hospital or something, uh, you know, after committing hyenas crime. Well, locally, the, 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 you know, we're actually reporting that people are getting six years for burglary. And that's going to be missing. So you're going to be relying on, 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 a, on a view of the world which is, which is biased towards um, signing an awful lot of papers. Yeah. <laughs> and not much else. Um, Roy, um, you know, perhaps you, you can pick up on that. One of your recent postings, or, or uh, this might have been a standard column, I can't remember, but you talked about that, that, that idea of it, it not being clear what we've lost until it's gone, and the, yes. this, 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 the, the, the sort of known unknowns and the unknown unknowns yeah. and all of that. You don't know what you're missing if yeah. you lose your local paper. I mean, I think they're all, I think they're, I, I, I disagree, I think in some places they are good uh, public watchdogs. I think mm. there's the holding power to account thing, I think there is the social history, local history thing. I think there is the social cohesion thing. You mentioned the social glue, reinforcing the sense of community. Um, and I also think you're right about uh, the idea of it being the local against the center of fighting on behalf. Uh, so I think that's, that's you know, fantastically important. Until the people, and, and, and the other thing is, I spoke about there being fewer readers and fewer buyers, but somehow, even having a local paper which is not necessarily read by the whole community or even only by a small amount of it, it filters its goodness, as it were, the good things that it has, filter across the whole community in the sense that because they are pushing the council uh, hard on a couple of things, because they're pointing out that um, there's a road safety problem on that particular road or that level crossing doesn't. It is for the la it's for the good of the whole community that it acts. And therefore the loss of it will mean that people didn't realize that that was the thing which made them safer, which made them better, and so on. Now, to add to Keith's story of Devon and, and Cornwall Police, there is quite clearly, and Kelvin McKenzie's column in The Sun recently he mentioned, and I've checked with Paul Potts, the uh, 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 chief executive of PA, there are judges saying that there are now court cases that are going uncovered that importantly should be covered. We also know, uh, and I can't actually reveal the source of this because I was told privately, that there are several councils which are being completely unreported across Britain. Uh, many <coughs> councils, obviously subcommittees are not being reported, but main council meetings and the caucuses that lead up to that are not being reported on. So that loss is something that necessarily local people won't be fighting for their local paper and say, we must have it, because they don't know that they're actually losing it. And I think that's the crucial thing. We as journalists and the chattering class or whatever, and we're always accused uh, of, being, uh, of worrying more about what people want than people know themselves. Well, that's our job. We know what they're missing. So it's for us to ensure that we try and fight to save it. But before I... I advance that, you know, that's, that's, my great that's my great belief that local newspapers are important. But I want to be careful about using that phrase newspapers, because I think we should be talking about news outlets and about brand transfers. I think, I forget who it was who said it here, that the brand is hugely important because it's known locally even if they don't buy it. And so encouraging people to come to that brand online for that moment when we go from the period of transition from newsprint to digital is hugely important because then the population will still come there and we must ensure whether we can save these 
brands or names or titles or whatever it is, that them having built up that audience, that journalists can congregate around it, whether they be citizen journalists or um, full-time journalists, skilled, brilliant journalists like Keith and myself, um, that they ensure that, in fact, there is somewhere that can still do all those jobs you talked about. I think that's the really important thing. And I, I think we overlook one other thing, one last thing I want to mention. In our recitation of the difference between regional dailies, locals, and hyperlocals, we miss one thing, Keith, of course, the difference between paid for newspapers and freeze. Mm -hmm. And I must say this, of the closures that I've detailed uh, recently, uh, it was only 53 at the time, I think it's grown to 61 now, all but one of those uh, were free newspapers. And I fell into the, uh, I'm, 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 to be frank with you, I want to share this with you all. I know it's being webcast. I'm not going to have a Roger Alton moment and suddenly realize that. <laughs> but um, I, I have to share with you a huge prejudice that I have against free newspapers, which I exercised on my blog. This was the lively bit. And, and got a tremendous kickback for it because it turns out that across Britain there are some good frees. Not many, but they are good, and some of them, so one has to be careful. But largely, we must realize that many of these free newspapers don't do the job that paid for us do, are not as hard hitting, are much more worried about income from advertising than they are about acting as journalists. So I'm largely concentrating on the good frees, the frees that do the proper job, and on paid for locals that carry on the tradition that I came into journalism light years ago to do. OK. Thank you. I'm glad we've we, we, we sort of brought in the, the, um, the digital parts of the, uh, of the conversation and those brands. Can I, I, I very quickly just ask the four of you, uh, very briefly, do you think that um, regional publishing groups have done enough, were quick enough to act in um, investing and understanding the move I online. feel another shipman moment coming up. <laughs> <laughs> John. Um, I, think it's, I, I think they're in a very difficult position because if you talk to the management and you, sa you say, I mean, I think uh, <coughs> a lot of print journalists are very savvy about the web because it's a very good tool for them. And um, a lot of them know about social media, they know about Twitter, they know about that, and they think these are all great things. But you say to the management, I'll say, well, who makes money out of social media? And that is the problem. You know, the internet is, is turning pounds into pennies. They, they know that the display advertising that they get on newspapers isn't going into the internet. They just know that's not going to happen. That, and that's why I think they're so pessimistic. Um, they just, I, I think they're very pessimistic that they can make that jump, that they can take, and they certainly, <laughs> uh, don't believe they can take the number of staff with them that they now have. Um, so I think that's very much going to alter the end product. It might be that um, you get coalitions of different people who've started their own uh, websites, but I don't think you'll get um, the same scale of journalism. Um, and I, I think they're in a, in a very difficult position. I, I, I think that... Um, I suppose there would be a tendency to concentrate on the paper, particularly people who've been brought up with print. Yeah. Um, but it's all very well saying, you know, invest in it, and they're going to turn around and say, well, where's the money going to come from? And that, that is the, the huge problem everyone's in at the moment. Okay. Uh, the argument could be it's inevitable, so you've just got to do it. But they cannot see the revenues that they get, or get they have had in newspapers really coming through on the internet. Okay. Keith? To answer your question, I. Um, did they fail? Did the current proprietors fail with the internet? Well, I can't think of uh, any group of people less likely to succeed on the internet than uh, the <laughs> people I've met who own local newspapers. I mean, when I left London to go to the provinces um, and you know, touring around as president of the Society of Editors, you realise that there's another country out there called England. It's not like London. It's completely different. There are sheriffs, there are lord lieutenants, there are power structures here that I had no idea of in London. And these are the people who are the independent publishers. Um, and it's those that I can speak mainly about. I'm not talking particularly about the big four, the big five. <coughs> but they, they run a hell of a lot of the local papers in this country. And they are very good at, at, at upholding local traditions. Um, uh, 
they do feel part of the community, they live among their communities. But as for understanding the internet, my God, they, I, mean, I, I still, they don't know what's hit them. <laughs> and you know, they're not the sort of people who will give the, give the go ahead to, to their younger journalists. I, I agree that there are very savvy young print journalists if they've been given some power by these people, but that's, that's that didn't happening. happen and it, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, William, is that your experience too? Um, <clears throat> I think it, it is interesting that uh, the companies that, that make money online uh, who've, who've managed to transfer the classified advertising online, um, something as the trade and media groups of, of, of this world. You know, they w a while ago, there was the thing called Fish 4, which you know, was, was you know, there was the potential there to actually you know, act together and, and build that critical mass. And the collaboration wasn't there, and you know, it didn't work. So, um, and, and did that fail? because they, the, the, the regional publishers weren't sufficiently committed to work together on something that could have... Uh, could I, d I don't know the why's and wherefore, so, so I wouldn't like to comment, but uh, yeah, with companies like that, it, it's very difficult to, to all follow this, the same purpose, especially <coughs> when we're talking about a new media that you know, people still haven't got their head around. I mean, talking about you know, how do you monetize it, people are still scratching their heads around that. So to go back however many years and, and work out, you know, it's, it's a tough ask. Yeah, yeah. Roy, briefly on this, and then because I do want to um, get to the operation. Well, I think many journalists would say that corporatized ownership was the dissolution of newspapers because too many decisions were taken that weren't, as Keith describes, taken locally for the good of locals. They were great at, at getting economies of scale, but gradually editors were sent in from other areas, many of the staff were hired from other areas, they didn't have the feel of the area. Uh, but I also think that's one thing, but I think also the problem was that decisions taken, you know, we're gonna cut 10%, so just cut 10% from the center, that's easily said, um, but its achievement was to reduce the quantity of journalists out there, which is why things aren't being covered. And when you reduce that, that easy cut, you say to yourself, well, am I going to bother to invest also in digital media? So they put their toe in the water. Some of them did it half-heartedly. Mm. And you look at the websites of, of, the, of the big four. Trinity mirrors aren't bad. News quests are pretty appalling. Johnston Press is uh, pretty lame. Northcliffe Media, not bad. Hull Daily Mail especially, brilliant, actually. But what they did again was, because they were corporatized media, they said, let us make all the decisions about digital media at the center. Let's, and they stifled local innovation. The big thing about digital media was that individuals who we couldn't easily name, I was one or two in this room, Martin's a very good example, of people who um, th just at themselves could see, we need to do that and could go for it. There are probably many people across Britain who could have done that, but when you're making centralized decisions, you don't allow that talent to come through. And it's a different talent, a different talent, it must be said, to uh, other forms of journalism. It's, it's challenging, it's new, it's revolutionary. And I'm afraid they stifled the revolution. So, um, so just as um, Keith's people didn't do it because they didn't know about it, these people kind of half knew about it but didn't do it properly. Right, okay. I don't want to be rude. Of course not, <coughs> of course not. Um, I want to, to get on, so slightly mindful of the time, I want to uh, get on to, to, to where we should be going, what, what operations sh we sh should we be carrying out um, in order to um, most uh, usefully save this patient. But before I do that, I mean, th th there are a number of people in the audience um, who um, I know will have some views. I can see Jean there and, and, and Dan Mason I can see at the back who, um, is there anything that y y you would like to, uh, not just those two, uh, anybody, is, is there anything that the, the, the audience would like to bring in? Dan, um, if you just could wait for the, um, if you could introduce yourself properly, Dan, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm uh, Dan Mason, uh, former editor of the Coventry Evening Telegraph and the Post until recently managing, <coughs> managing editor for NewsQuest here in London. Uh, to pick up on, on a couple of points to do with the state of the patient, and the uh, award hogging Keith just happened to throw out there a, a, a thing about the local newspapers not having a brand when they first started. And that's where you're exactly, I think, Keith's wrong and is one of the problems that we face today. If you look back at the birth of all of our regional papers, they were successful local business people 
uh, I, the, you know, Coventry bookseller, <coughs> being the journalist in Birmingham, we all have the same stories, who in fact were local brands, and they were local key influences when they started. Now, the interesting thing is to draw the parallel now is where I think that's, that's happened is we've completely abrogated our respons responsibility as leaders on a local scale. And that goes from the senior management through to journalists in many respects. But I certainly always felt as, a, as an editor, one of the things I always said to, to journalists, one of the first things you'd say is, when you walk out of that door, remember you're carrying my reputation with me, the reputation of our newspaper, and everybody who's gone before you, but most importantly, your own reputation. The fact of the matter is, as time has gone by, they've had less and less time to get out of the office, less and less time to interact. They've done their best. Our communities have, have changed dramatically. But back to the leadership element and the management element, we do not operate at a different level. Our managements have been happy to take on a local scale the money at incredible yield. At incredible yield. And while you've got, you know, you've got some of our um, compatriots who are taking the advertising from who were working on mar mar margins of, of 6 to 10%, we were sailing away with margins of 30%. And, and we were not even going to say hello to them on a senior level. So just the point that I'm making is one of the conditions we're in, is that while we've been paddling like hell beneath the surface as journalists, in some respects, and some of our newspapers have been doing, I think, a very good job, and I would say, personally, that we cannot go down the slippery slope of drawing distinctions between free and news and paper, actually. Good journalism is good journalism wherever you find it. <coughs> what we have done is said goodbye to working at different levels and to having some real local leadership that can operate at a local level. We've got trapped totally in needing to carry on driving shareholder value and having those high margins, and there is still a bit of a but I think that's really at the, the core of what's wrong at the moment. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, Mrs. Morgan. Yeah. I could do it without you. I don't think no, it's no, because you'll be recording. It's the web. What's for the web, We don't want to miss it's every word, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a web first. I'm Jean Morgan. I'm ex-Press Gazette, and I apologise for the abundance of Press Gazette this evening. <laughs> but... Um, Following on from what Dan is saying, the thing that's worrying me at the moment, and I've lived through, at my age you can see, several of these cyclical downturns, I do think there will be green shoots. But the real thing that worries me at the moment is the suggestion, backed by the Society of Editors, that the competition should allow more merger. Now, I'm thinking about it on the point of view as a journalist, when I started in journalism, if you fell out with management, if you wanted promotion, you went to the man across the city, a different employer, and you got a job. Ten miles down the road, there was another employer. Now, the choice gets more and more limited, and that impacts on the reader. The reader doesn't get the choice. Do you, as a forum, believe the idea of more mergers making sense. Okay, a very salient question, um, which brings it, I, I think I might start with William on this one, um, because you've done some work on this specifically, yep. um, and I think you've got some interesting uh, suggestions about, mm. about that whole area, so can we start with you on that? All right, well, uh, I suppose there are two points to it. One is, I think, from a, from a sort of legal perspective, it, when the competition laws were, were last re rethought, they didn't think about the, the fragmentation of, of media as has happened in terms of online and radio and what have you. So from a, from a legalistic perspective, I think the, the ownership rule laws are outdated. Having said that, I don't think that if you allowed uh, the, the, the big four to swap titles and, and build up big, uh, big um, sort of fortresses in, in, in certain regions, that wouldn't necessarily save, save the local journalism at all. I mean, I think there's... I think it's a bit of a red herring to say, oh, well, we'll do that and that will sort of keep people off our backs for a, a year or so while we go through all the, 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 the complexity of, of, of matching all the, the operations back together. I think that there, there's a load that they can do in terms of 
the back office operations, uh, even as they're structured at the moment, to, to free up resources as much as possible for, for that local journalism. I, I really do, and I, I think this whole thing of sort of merging, merging more is, is, is a red herring, as I said. Are you able to be any more specific about that, about what more they should be doing in that, uh, in that yep. back office level that means they don't have to cut journalists and they can save the Well, I suppose it, yeah, where, where I'm coming from here is, is um, you know, in a perfect world, you would still have vertic vertically integrated uh, brands. So in, in a certain town, yes, there you would have your journalists, you'd have your editorial production, you'd have your ad sales people. You'd have your, your inbound ad sales people, you have your circulation people, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to your, your printing press. Over time, the back office side is, has been centralized in, in the big companies and actually, to a certain extent, centralized across some of the, the companies as well. And the question that I've got is, now that you can no longer afford that, that vertical integration, are some of the big titles or even the small titles, are they going far enough in getting the... Uh, the, the uniformity of process uh, and, and the investment in infrastructure that enables them to, to still uh, keep the, the investment in the things that make the money, i.e. The, the commercial people who understand the local businesses and, and um, how, to, how to partner with them to make money, and more importantly, the local journalists. So uh, my concern is that, that when some of these uh, organisations are, are looking to cut costs, it's sort of cutting across every single department rather than actually looking at a, a bit more sort of deeply about where the true quality and the, and the value lies in the organisation. Okay, thank you. Um, and then which does, you know, kind of bring us forward to, to, to what we should be doing as a, as a medical team, you know, where, where should we be inserting the scalpel or, or what exactly should we be doing? And I, I would like to go to, to, to the rest of the panel. That, and, and back to William, because I know there, there are some interesting ideas um, out of some of the work that you've done. Um, you know, are there are there any obvious answers? Well, there's, I, I think there's uh, the medical, the doctors and nurses are, are split, because half the doctors and nurses think you need to get smaller. Um, you, the, there is um, a great future for the sort of type of community. Uh, journalism community papers that Keith was talking about um, and then you've got what I probably would be the consultants who drive Bentley saying um, well actually we just need to get bigger uh, have less doctors but uh, more important and I think uh, the point Jean, Jean made I mean there's uh, it seems to be the antithesis of, of you know what local papers are all about now how can these groups say to the BBC you can't come in here because we're the local people and then decide to have um, news factories you know 40 or 50 miles away and I think there is a tendency that um, journalists tend to follow the, where the print works be, the out of, the out of town building and you know the, the, the sort of presence on a high street where people could actually come in and talk to a journalist they, they tend to disappear and um, I, I think I, I think they'll definitely I think the government will be persuaded that yeah you know these things are old-fashioned and we should relax but I'm not quite sure you know what's going to be swapped but I think for journalists, it, it'll, it'll mean just mean more job cuts because you know, that's how they, they see that the, they will make money. And the, the point Gene made about you know, these massive groups, I mean, um, a friend of mine was made redundant in, uh, in Bristol. And you've basically, if you've been made redundant by Northcliffe, you can't then go and get another job in another Northcliffe paper because you've taken your redundancy. It really means you've got to leave that area, you've got to leave the West Country. There's nowhere, there's nowhere for you to work. And that, again, is a sort of antithesis to, to the sort of local thing. I mean, you've got this papers who are campaigning about, you know, keeping the inland revenue offices in Derby at the same time as sending their subs away to Nottingham and Hull. Yeah. OK. Keith. Um, yeah, I agree with um, Jean. I think the Society of Editors is absolutely bonkers on this, and they've got it completely wrong. They've just gone along with the Newspaper Society, and sadly, Andy Burnham, the culture and media and whatever, has also gone along with them as well. Um, and they seem to be saying they're buying this ridiculous argument that um, we're not a monopoly because we don't have a monopoly of advertising outlets. You know, it's all about the advertising. You know, there's Yellow Pages, Thompson Local Pages, um, there's ITV, there's you know, so we don't, a local paper does not have a monopoly of advertising. I mean, they, they, they 
the owners regard papers, they regard the product as the audience, and the consumer is the advertising. Is the, is, the, is the advertiser, and they're delivering the audience to the advertiser, and they're saying, um, provided there are loads of advertisers out there, um, sorry, lo loads of people competing to deliver these audiences, at no point does anybody come along and, and uh, say that there's, a, there's some sort of public duty to inform or, or to do the, make it the role of, of the local paper. Um, you know, like the ITV stations, when they were set up, they had to guarantee giving a certain amount of local news. And what we want is more regulation, not less regulation, I would think, you know, a bit like the banks. <laughs> you would th I think it's absolutely amazing that they, they're, they're getting away with this argument, which only frees, frees them up to uh, attempt to make, to squeeze the pips even more. Nobody is talking about the service to the public, <coughs> to the readers. Okay, thank you, Keith. Um, Roy, could you pick up on that and maybe then segue into your own thoughts on a sort of public service type yeah. PA-led body that might I was th I was help. always struck with the fact that the Newspaper Society used to have this slogan, all life is live local, in order to make you feel good about local papers. At the same time, that all profits went national <laughs> or international. <laughs> uh, and they didn't plough them back, as Dan said. And by the way, it was 35% profit margin these people were getting and pushing for 36 and 37 and when they had that wonderful yield were they pumping that back into the business no they weren't so what should we do allow them to get bigger still allow them who've already I was going to use a bad word screwed it up to actually get bigger that seems to me to be utterly iniquitous they've already ruined the industry and now they want to give a chance uh, pleading to the government to, to do it again that seems to me to be utterly wrong. There's a huge unity here about this. So I agree absolutely with Gene as well. Plurality is not about whether or not you offer plural opportunities to advertisers. It's about whether you offer plural opportunities to citizens. Yes, publishers see selling an audience of consumers, but we don't serve consumers. We understand the reality that it needs to make money, but we serve citizens. That's, that's I mean, yeah, it's a bit high flown a bit holier than thou, but that, we don't, we, we, we didn't come into it uh, uh, in the Roy Thompson slogan of fitting in bits of copy between the ads. That wasn't how we saw it. And if you ask any journalist uh, starting out uh, who doesn't become overly cynical too soon, why did you come into journalism? They don't say, I came into it to make a profit. They say, I came into it to do good, to entertain perhaps, to amuse, to inform but not to do that. So I think it's really important that we don't simply allow the government to, to accede to this request, that what they do is ending up swapping titles, creating geographical monopolies. And I, I, I see the logic. I see the logic, by the way, and that is it will cut down the number of printing plants. They'll be even more remote than now, and creation of huger word <coughs> factories than exist at present and will remove the local. All life is live local, but your local paper won't be there to be living it. That's the other drama. So, I, so of course, I'm in favor of small startups. But let me, let me deal with the substantive question. That is, do we have another business model? If it's not immediately, the small is beautiful of Keith that John also talked about. Um, and we are uh, motivated against the idea that even greater consolidation works. We still have to think that there might be other business models. Could we ever be tempted by the concept of public subsidy on the lines, for instance, of the BBC? Now, we think the BBC has just been told, yeah, you're not offering your public service and your journalism locally. Uh, we were hands off, don't let up, don't, newspaper society and the publishers say, don't do that, we, we want the right to do that. Okay, the BBC are locked out. But in a way, the BBC are the only public service organization. They need competition. So we should be the competition, but how do we fund it? I would have said that there's more money slopping about in, uh, in all sorts of ways that could be administered through a BBC-like structure. I don't mean creating yet another BBC trust or board of governors or something, but we could use the good offices, say, just an example of the Press Association, which is owned jointly already by the publishers, to administer a fund which could be, uh, which, which could be a public fund. 
I'm not really in favor of local councils doing it because local councils seem to be trying to drive us out of business of another form, and that is by forming their own newspapers and taking away yet more advertising from local newspapers and at the same time being largely Pravda propaganda sheets for their own councils. That would be wrong. And I'm terrified, by the way, incidentally, of that happening in Dagenham, uh, where the local paper is in considerable trouble and now they're launching a council paper against it and there's already a fomentation of BNP. Imagine a local, a local area served by a BNP newspaper. A, a terrible thing to contemplate, but, but quite possible in that benighted area of my youth. So, um, uh, so public subsidy is a possibility, I think, and should at least be considered, should at least be considered. Um, otherwise, I think, we have to go gradually to the small is beautiful model, and that is new startups but new startups, we try and rescue journalism and wrestle with these other brands at the same time. And we have to do that within the shadow of those brands. And that's going to be a very difficult thing to do. And I don't think there's enough, at the moment, enough public ferment to make that happen. And we still have to find a way of funding journalism. And if the advertising model doesn't work, and the big corporations don't work, and even the smaller companies, like your lovely Burgess company and... Uh, and the Grahams in Wolverhampton and the Bormans in Kent and the Ilifts are all suffering in different ways. Um, if they can't do it either, we have to say, if journalism's that important, then we must demand that the public, under and we need to go on a crusade to do that, to encourage the public to believe that public subsidy can still keep us independent from government, as the BBC is, uh, and at the same time fund papers in order to preserve local democracy. It's worth pointing out, too, that before people start screaming against the concept of public subsidy, that all the, all the newspapers are exempt from VAT, and also they rely a hell of a lot on national advertising and even on local advertising. Okay. I, d I do want to get some, some sense of what the, the um, audience here feels about this um, public service um, uh, fund idea. But, be, but, be, but before we do that, I just wanted to go back to William because yeah. I know there is a there is an, an interesting suggestion that, that you have based on a kind of a franchise um, concept that um, I'd certainly not heard before. And um, once you've got your microphone back yeah. on, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it sort of touches on a couple of things that, that have been mentioned here, um, uh, and it might just be a sort of um, holding off to the barbarians for a little bit longer. But sort of, in terms of people that I've talked to in the industry, very much talk about, you know, it's about maintaining that local presence, maintaining the journalists, maintaining the, the local commercial people who, who know about it, um, and the amount of people who said actually everything has got too centralised, and and we've talked about, you know, the, the, from a web perspective, you know, why are those decisions being making up, made central office miles away, and uh, people say actually if we were given more autonomy at a local. Uh, a, a local point of view, we could make it work potentially. So one of the things, sort of following on from uh, what I was mentioning earlier about working out what are the the services, the the back office services that are provided or need to be provided. How do you get those as efficient as possible? Where do you draw the line between the things that have to be local and you know, the, the 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 high street branch? You know, it, is that something that actually that really will drive be the focus of of the community, and that's where we can have our office for the journalists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's a potential model which which is starting to, to work with, dare I say, the, the independent moving into the, the mail building at a, at a national level, where you could potentially uh, take all the, the service elements of a, uh, and again, I don't say newspaper, a media company, and almost franchise out the brand and and the journalist and commercial element at the local level. So you potentially get back to the you know, the old style. I am. I am the 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 move and the shape in a local community, and it's going to. I'm going to take it on because I think we can make money here, and I think we haven't covered uh, a, a certain area with enough uh, journalists on the ground. And if it works, and, and and my hunch is correct, then I make money. If I'm wrong, I'm I'm doing a good thing for the community. Now that might be a very naive point of view, but it's a way where you can you can see the the current owners actually stepping away gradually rather than pulling the plug when uh, it goes into the red. Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, uh, um, Julia, we, 
Is there any particular finishing point that we no have to No one's leaving, we're having to? fun. No? Okay, fine. <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> um, as a, as a, uh, but as a final point then, um, I, I would just encourage anybody who's, uh, any thoughts on what they've <coughs> heard tonight um, to f feedback, particularly perhaps on these, on these later um, uh, points that have, that have been, the latest ideas that have been uh, generated here. And if, if there are any other brilliant ideas out there, I'm sure we'd be delighted to hear them. Patrick. <laughs> I'd be interested to just return to that idea. Can you just introduce Sorry, yourself yes. for the benefit of the web, your web audience, Sorry, Patrick? Yeah. It's Patrick Smith. I'm a reporter for paid content and uh, also previously off press as uh, several people are. <laughs> um, and I just want to return to the idea of, of, of the public subsidy. And, uh, and Keith, you mentioned before that the, the crisis in local democracy and even in national democracy, really, with the decline of printed media, but I can't help feeling that there's a real split between people that care locally and buy local newspapers and people that don't, and it might be a generational thing. I mean, will a great deal of people in their communities actually notice if a local paper shut down? I mean, I, I as a fan of the press, I don't <coughs> want that to happen. I'm sure a lot of people here feel like that, but do people understand local councils? I mean, what what it, what what actually is a, 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 you know a uh, opposition councillor and, and the process of it? So I just want to ask, really, is is there a a, a sort of a, a more fundamental point about the relationship between democracy and people <laughs> and education? Does it go even deeper than? The well, it, is, it goes socially extremely deep. It's about birth, deaths, marriages. It's about your child in the nativity play. It's about your mate being ribbed for letting in 10 goals in the Sunday Football League that he's got from the local paper. There's miles of stuff before you ever get to councils. And <coughs> okay, there's a, you know, four or five percent probably who are interested in reading about the councils. Only, you know, 25 percent, 20 percent bother to vote. So it's fairly small, but it's, it, it, it is a, it is there, it is there as a watchdog. The more, it, you know, I can't remember when a local paper last really did over a local council, probably Doncaster. But there aren't, you know, they're few and far between. And, and that's what I'm saying, that I think the, the role of local paper is far more important than that on a social level. You know, who's going to record the minutiae of, of people's lives? Where is it all going to come from? The Daily Mail. Well, people know. read the Metro, which has none of that. Mm. Millions of people. Mm. No, but the point... Yeah. The Not the in point Carlisle, though. <laughs> Not in <laughs> Carlisle. <laughs> yeah. the, point, the point, Patrick, is <coughs> that because a small it's only a minority that are interested, they do that, as I said earlier, on behalf of the majority. That's always been the way. Uh, if you, if, whatever anyone says about the, the penetration of newspapers in this country, it's always been a relative minority that have read the serious stories or read the serious press or whatever, but that's important. What are we saying? Because not enough people read The Guardian and The Times that we ought to give up on that because they're only a minority of the population? No, those minorities, that's us, by the way, the, the people who opt in, they're really important to the rest of society, even if the rest of the society kicks us in the balls and says they don't care about it. Yeah. But you would see in, in your sort of reading of the press for, you know, for longer. So long? I'm sorry, but there's Thank been you. a... Thank you. Sorry. There, but there's, you, you, you must admit there's been a real change, especially in the national press, in the agenda and the seriousness of it, and that's permeated throughout the, the whole thing. Do you not think? No. Uh, do you think the serious press is not as serious as it was? It's just as serious today, more serious. Times carries more foreign pages now than it did 20 years ago. Same as The Guardian. Telegraph's a different story. Uh, and the foundation of The Independent uh, itself was a tribute to that. Now, I don't, I, I don't agree. I think there's still a lot of serious news out there, still serious content on television. It still only gets a minority audience. Few people watch Jeremy Paxman, but he's still important to our society. The Guardian has Jade on the front page, but that's just being ironic. <laughs> yeah, I forgot the postmodern element. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks. Um, Greg Neal. Uh, Never heard of him. Media historian, I suppose, now. Um, just to put two points together um, from the conversation, and apologies, uh, I got in from Oxford uh, after the meeting started, so if, if I missed one of these points. It does seem to me that there are two potentially conflicting uh, questions that are being batted around. Um, first of all, there is the question of, and I, and I think uh, I 
agree totally with uh, what Roy and Keith have been talking about, about the need for um, a rediscovery of local values because of the value that local press has for uh, local societies. But I also hear my old friend Jean and others talking about what's happened to an industry which provides career structures. And in fact, if we recall the halcyon days where people are like, Roy and Keith and I started off locally and then you know, scuttled off to fleet as soon as, soon as we could. All the economics point away from the continuation of local journalism, if by that we mean attracting, nurturing, and quite crucially, keeping journalism local. Because what that really means, if we're not to go down a very problematic citizen journalism route, uh, is actually being able to employ people locally and possibly making them feel that there are career opportunities staying where they are. Back, if you like, to the ideas of you know working for a big regional paper or indeed a respected local evening paper as being something that you wanted to do for the foreseeable future of your career and not because you were going to scuttle off to Fleet Street as soon as the opportunity came, partly because it was the way to advance your career, but partly also because you may didn't, maybe didn't see a future for local journalism. So I wonder how our panelists can reconcile those ideas about, yes, the need to keep journalism local, but also the need to actually keep talented journalists who in former years would have gone away at a local level, and how we can actually be made to pay for them. Anybody want to dive in Well, I'll, I'll just dive in straight away, Greg. Nice to see you again. Um, the, I think when I talk about local community papers, um, the, the involvement of citizen journalists, amateurs, volunteers, whatever you call them, um, the, the, I mean, I have experience of it happening um, in one of the towns in Cumbria, in Barrow. There's been a, four community papers within Barrow, which have been going now for five years. And they, they had a, a local senior journalist embedded within those communities to help get it off the ground. It was printed on the printing press at Barrow, still going up four or five years. They're only 12 pages and they're only monthly, um, but it does involve the community. And I think there are two issues. One, one is that on, a, on that local level, you don't need to be a qualified journalist. You don't need to get into all that in order to update the Sunday Football League in order to record you know, a marriage or whatever. Um, so I think that, that that's some form of, of local online or whatever, which has a future. Um, I think, Greg, what you're talking about, the idea of quality journalism, where is it going to come from? Where is it going to be nourished? I mean, hopefully, it will as much come from those communities, because there are people there interested in journalism. They haven't gone through uh, the graduate structure, etc., but they are interested in their communities. And hopefully, at Barrow, again, we do have um, a lecturer in journalism from UCLan, <coughs> from the University of Central Lancashire, very good journalism school, coming down talking to them on a, on a weekly or a monthly basis for a couple of hours. It's some start to teaching people about news values. And I, and I think that that is one kind of future um, growing out of local communities. I mean, that's an interesting model, sure. But Yes, the local football club secretary will diligently return the Sunday football uh, results to a local community-based paper. It doesn't cost him or her very much money, very much time. But to have someone spending a lot of time digging deep into local council corruption, um, perhaps keeping an eye on the police courts, that does take time. And in the meantime, whoever's doing that has got to actually have to pay the rent. There is, a, it seems to me, a key and crucial question in terms of you know, employment of journalism, employment of you know, long-term journalistic skills, as to how you actually finance that model yeah. within all the exciting alternatives, as you outlined, yeah. of community journalism. Well, that particular model at Barrow did start off, uh, now I recall, with, with a grant from the Regional Development Agency. And, uh, and I guess some structure like that, you know, where you call it a, you know, a media enterprise board, mm. well, something along... Uh, that the, the regional development well, agency money was the stuff I was talking about sloughing around at uh, I, 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 mm. this is part of that public subject. Um, I, I think the thing is, Greg, now is that the national papers aren't actually soaking up all those journalists from the regional press anymore because what they're doing is recruiting them themselves. Mm. 
Um, and I think in the old days there was an actual uh, a kind of NUJ agreement that said you couldn't employ people in Fleet Street who hadn't worked outside which kind of set this pattern of people working on weekly papers, daily papers, and then going, going off to Fleet Street quite quickly. I don't think that's going to happen anymore. I think they, will, they can cherry pick you know, the brightest people at City University from uh, Roy's course. Um, and that route's being denied journalists. Um, so the route they're taking now is to go into things like PR. And the, the, I think the biggest problem for quality journalists region, regionally is the pay so, so um, poor and just doesn't keep up with them. Um, any kind of comparable graduate salaries or even police salaries, nursing salaries, teaching salaries. It's just so way behind. Um, I'm not quite sure why that is. I think that's because, to a certain extent, regional companies thought, well, we'll train the young people and then, then they'll go off. So, you know, what's the point in investing in them? But the, the salaries have fallen so far behind. Um, I, I think probably even far behind, or you probably weren't paid very much, but your expenses were probably quite good. And um, I just think the salaries of regional journal. That is, that's the problem. And I, I don't think that, that sort of conveyor belt to the nationals exists anymore. I think also there's, there, there's something other than geographical sectors. There are specialist sectors where we could look at interesting um, models of financing, like a group of people interested in defence. There may have been, um, you know, there used to be a lot of very, very good local defence correspondents. God knows whether they exist any longer. They did their training at Portsmouth. They did their, you know, bar where, where the defence industry was. It may be that you could get a collection of those sort of people who would produce quality journalism with specialist knowledge, and that there would be some kind of media enterprise board that they could get backing from. Can we have a microphone down here, please? <coughs> Thanks. My name is Ali Alzaz, and uh, I'm not in the industry, but I'm interested in it. So we've talked about alternative funding sources, but how would that affect independence of media? And we saw what happened with the BBC, and I think there are any question marks about it, whether they're influenced with the recent uh, events around Gaza, and uh, the problems they've been through with various uh, fiascos. So whoever controls the funding in the end will have a huge influence on in how things go, so how will it be affected if we do have a, uh, public funding of some sort. I will, I will go to Roy first on that. I'd actually, just but just before we do, can I, can I just ask for a show of hands on on that very specific point about? Can you put your hand up if if you have any degree of unease about the idea of a uh, sort of public service fund to um, go into local journalism? Okay, so that's probably about half of the room, I would guess. M more than half. Yeah. No, I think that I think that's yeah. understandable. I mean, I think that it is a concern, of course, but I don't know. Um, you could say to yourselves, uh, "What else can we do?" No one's come up with, by the way, noticeably, uh, an alternative. But secondly, I think that we do believe, don't we, that the BBC is constantly under pressure from the state, but in a in a state of of conflict with the state. And I think that it, the same would be true largely in this case about the independence. But I think the difference here is that most local newspapers are not in conflict with the central state. They may be in conflict locally, which is not a problem if it's centrally funded. So I, don't, I think, in fact, there would be less of a problem for independent journalism locally than there would be even at the national level than there is for the BBC. So I think over time, I, I think if you had local councils funding local journalism, that would be problematic. But I think a national fund, properly administered and overseen, uh, would, would not really compromise independence. I hope I've changed just everyone's mind and you're all going <laughs> to yeah. immediately well, say, well, right on, Roy. Yeah. Right. What yeah. I'd like to say is, is, um, is when people talk about subsidies, is actually subsidizing journalists, which in fact is a feature of the industry anyway, because a lot of people work for nothing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, or are cadets or whatever. But I think if the money was, was channeled and say, we've lost 900 jobs in journalism. Why can't we put some money back into supporting uh, journalists? So the job is actually what's supported, not the company. So you could say, uh, you know, you, you could bid and say, well, you know, can, can we have five journalists funded from a central source? But that's not saying that the local council is funding you. Um, you've got loads of students coming out of college. You know, what's going to happen to them? We're in this year this transition between the sort of old media and the new media where 900 jobs have just disappeared <coughs> i was just wondering if there's any way that, that uh, of, of funding you know these these people who are coming out for a year or so just to to get them started okay i think we've got some uh, point Can we just here. 
Hi, I'm Barbara Gawley from Captain Light Telecom Region Entertainment Practice and Consultant. Um, I'm just picking up on the point about uh, public service money going into regional journalism. Um, just saw Richard Branson on the television uh, in an interview recently saying um, we shouldn't be putting money, public service money, into the car manufacturing firms. Um, this old style model. Uh, Companies should be left to die out if that's if that's the way it should be, and we should be putting money into public service money instead into more entrepreneurial firms, um, into the new electric cars, for example. Isn't it sort of a question that hasn't really been raised? You know, we talk about small is beautiful. Isn't it better to to encourage a small startup companies who may be more innovative, doing things online, creating innovative sort of ecosystems or partnerships with the mobile handset manufacturers? You know, bringing right. online new, you know, news to your handset. You know, this is where all the youngsters, for example, you know, are migrating to, and it's generally the pattern that everyone follows suit. But, and and uh, also create the sort of ecosystem or partnerships with the BBC, getting their news um, to to the, the videos to to uh, regional news. Because you know, we talk about the advertising model being dead, but the advertising is migrating online, and it is generally migrating to video display uh, advertising. Well, I think, the, uh, yes, I mean, to take that head on, I think that we'd have to encourage that, that public subsidy to be truly public, and that is it would not only be an attempt, it would, well, I think the way to see it is saving local journalism, whether that local journalism is within uh, current brands or within startups. So I, and I think that it needs to be made available, checks and balances can be built in so to do. So. I am, I'm all in favor, absolutely, as a digital missionary. I'm, of course, I'm <laughs> extremely keen that we see um, such startups continuing, yeah, uh, uh, going forward, yeah. I hate that phrase, going forward, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely the NUJ's line, isn't it, that the money shouldn't be given to the big um, publishing companies, you know, the, because they feel that their their old models are busted, and that the money should you know, have lots of conditions on it. And well, go, what we're, go what we're saying is, journalism, funded by private capital, has failed in that the business model of private capital has failed. So we have to find another model, because what we're talking about here is the saviour of journalism, not the saviour of newspaper yes. organisations. Indeed. And I think that's probably quite a good point well, to good. finish on, unless there are any final points from the, from the crowd. Yes, of course, Patrick. Please do. As long as you're agreeing with me. <laughs> yeah, I am absolutely. Uh, just a question for, for William, if I might. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of the, um, the the regional press companies and in terms of their commitment to digital, I mean, every year and every quarter we look at the annual reports and yeah. they always have this um, figure and the advertising slightly going up in the regionals yeah. and uh, slightly, more, slightly going down actually digitally in the case of uh, the Daily Mail mm. and General Trust. But, is there a sense that they're trying to talk up their investment in digital a little bit more than they're actually investing it in to impress the shareholders, to you know, to have a, a feel good around the, you know, the board table or, or, or whatever it is? I mean, do you think they really are investing a lot of money? In well, if you yeah, to be realistic, if if you if all your figures aren't looking too good, you're, you're obviously going to going to uh, look for any growth figure, e even if it's you know, not going to not going to save your bacon. So that's why. Those, those numbers come out, obviously. Um, I mean, I think it was, it was back to what we said earlier about the, the, the investment in online. If there was an obvious payback, then that's where the, the investment would be made. Because there isn't that obvious payback, there's a, well, we sort of need to invest in it to be in the game to try and keep our audience, but you know, do we really want to put the house on it? So it's, it's sort of some of, the, some of the issues we talked on earlier. Yes, 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 please. Joe from Brighton. Hi, I'm Joe Wadsworth. I'm from the Argus in Brighton. Um, you've made the point that um, the big groups haven't invested enough online, but you also made the point that the small groups haven't invested at all. There's also obviously a wealth of talent there that if we are to go on to small startups, say, um, or publicly funded journalism, um, you would want to harness. How do you persuade people whose instinct is, well, actually, the first of all, the question is, would your startup be online or in print? Would it matter? 
and if it would be better to be online, um, how do you persuade those very talented people that online is the way forward if the culture isn't there already? Is that me? Can be anybody. You start, Roy. Uh, well, I mean, the point is that uh, you're going, uh, but the very nature of the startup, it's risk taking, isn't it? And it's risk taking uh, for the people involved. It could involve, in, it, you know, just it, a hypothetical example is that we're, we're, we're seeing a number of skilled journalists or experienced journalists pushed out of work, not least at your own newspaper. Deputy editor went recently, didn't he? You might not think he was that skilled, but anyway. Um, I've only been there six weeks. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mr. Leduc had gone by then, yeah. But um, uh, you would you would see really a marriage here between what we might call the young thrusting digital tyros and the experienced journalists. In fact, I think experienced journalists should be, in fact, mentoring uh, uh, people in the community anyway, uh, because I think that's the way we're going to get user-generated content, which is going to f be a big part of this. And the answer, by the way, is that startups in newsprint are really not going to happen. Uh, that you know the the, the cost of uh, starting a production like that would be impossible. No, we're really talking about the future, and the future is online. Would anybody else on the panel go with a print-based startup? Well, one has just been money? one has just been tried in Carlisle. <laughs> <laughs> a magazine, a monthly oh, right, a monthly magazine called Carlisle Living, which is an attempt to go for a younger generation. Um, it's very very bold. It's brilliantly produced, um, and I hope it's still there in, in a year or two's time. It goes against the grain of anything else. But then there are people who go against the grain. Tyndall is one that we mentioned. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, he's still been making money. Champion. Murdoch is still making nice, positive noises about newspapers. Yeah, he would. Uh, Champion newspapers in, in uh, Stockport um, have, have started something up, and I think um, the ILIF group uh, somewhere around there have started a couple up. But these are really small. You know, small. small. But I mean, that's small. what we are, we are talking small. Well, these we? are, we are really, small. yeah, these are really tiny. But I, I mean, uh, I, I still think the future's online. Get online. Get yeah. online. If you've got a bit of public money, would you? Would you, would you yeah, I, I, I think I'd, I'd like to start a weekly magazine for journalists myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be, be very successful. I'm uh, Meredith Jaski. I work for The Independent, which has been uh, mentioned this evening and um, comes under various different models that have been mentioned. Um, I'd also admit to being a dinosaur in that I do think that there may actually be a future for print. Um, I'd just like to contest two points have been made. Um, one of them is this question of startups as to whether they should be online or in print. <coughs> um, there are a few examples of things that have been done the other way round. Um, so Ian Dale's politics blog has been transferred to a magazine. And it doesn't seem to me impossible that the two things couldn't exist somehow side by side and coexist. Because at least for print, there is a cost model with people paying for it which is markedly lacking on, uh, online. And from everything that Roy has said this evening, he has still not been able to make a case for online alone being able to pay for itself. Um, the other thing, I just wonder whether there isn't more, um, you were talking about maybe some sort of competition um, between BBC Regional and some sort of um, startups or regional press, whether there isn't a case somehow for more cooperation that if the BBC is going to extend its tentacles into the sort of smallest minutiae of local life, whether their staffing and their license fee money can't somehow be capitalised on to, to the advantage of local media, whether in print or, in, uh, or online. Um, and I also noticed, and I tend to agree um, with William about the um, question of people's preferences. Yes, people talk about, you know, everybody sort of under 30 reading everything online and only online but i'm not convinced that's true because reading online is very haphazard it's very small scale and if you have the possibility of reading something in print that uh, i'm not surprised by his surveys which suggest that people prefer that okay thank you very much oh, we've got hands <laughs> going up now um dan first then jean perhaps I think there's one at the back as well. 
on the subject of the BBC, it's been picked up a couple of times. It's a very short one. The BBC thought long and hard about going into local video, as we know. At the end, they decided not to, having already committed £68 million pounds to the license from, from the budget from, uh, from license payers. But a simple question might be, number one, what's happened to that money? Number two, why could that not? Because the argument given why they didn't do it was that the local press could provide that local video service. And they can't, let's face it. Why on earth couldn't that money be provided, in, as you say, in, in direct um, support? Just back to the public service uh, element. As a journalist, I believe I am a public servant. However, um, I feel like I need to reconcile the, uh, the, the element that I do not think that handouts are the way forward. I think being independent is an essential part of what I do, responsibility with independence. Of the, so therefore, I do go down very much more the, the enterprise route. Um, and some of the uh, some of the models being looked at at the moment, which I think do hold a little bit of water. The great thing about all of this, nobody has the answers. So, you know, talking about the future for print and online, the great thing, the really exciting thing is that nobody has the answer. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic position to be in. But a social enterprise model, which is actually about standing on your own two feet and the right to fail, and about making a profit, but being committed to putting some of that back into making the community better. And getting back to the fundamentals, as far as I'm concerned, is that the basic role of a journalist to make a positive difference to the community they serve. So yes, I think public um, service and an element of public funding is the way forward, but not through handouts. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, we've got one on the back there, one on the back there, and Jean at the front here, and one over there. Hi, my name is Ravi. I'm a social enterprise consultant. So on the point that uh, this gentleman here was making, uh, I'm actually helping, trying to help a community magazine become self-sustainable financially. They're currently funded by the by the NDC, which is the New Deal for Communities. Um, so we're trying to kind of tr wean them off grant funding and help them. <laughs> develop innovative models to become you know, financially sustainable. And well, I like just, to just to be clear, this is a print, mag print, a print magazine you're talking about? It is a print magazine. It's a quarterly magazine. Uh, and uh, uh, both uh, one of the panelists and a uh, gentleman here mentioned about innovative partnerships. And we are considering a training model where uh, we can partner with academic institutions or uh, employment training agencies where they send their students or uh, candidates through the magazine for training. And that part of the training would be publication of this magazine, end of the training publication of this magazine. But now how do we monetize a scheme like this would be another challenge. But it is an innovative model that's up for, I guess, the jury is still out, but there's an example of a magazine called Catch 22. It's again a community magazine that has attained uh, financial sustainability with exactly this model. OK, thank you. Um, I think there's one over here. <coughs> Hello, I'm Laura Oliver from journalism.co.uk. Just to go back to the BBC again. Um, the money that was planned for the local video proposals, I believe, has been earmarked. And yes, it will have to be properly managed. And I'm sure we'll have another lengthy inquiry by the Trust into how it's going to be done. But the BBC's made the right noises in terms of training opportunities, partnerships with ITN Regional, partnerships with regional newspapers. And it's really up to the local industry, I think, on how they accept that they're also working on training courses at UCLan for regional news journalists but it's up to the local industry as well to take that sort of olive branch or hand of partnership I think. Okay thanks Laura. Absolutely right. Um, Jean? Um, I just want to ask one thing. Uh, you mentioned the local development agency funding uh, projects in journalism. Who's looking into the Corruption in the local development agency. <laughs> 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 Good point. Martin. Um, another former colleague uh, in the um, I was struck by Roy's point about it always being a minority of people interested in sort of the, 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 the serious civics stuff of, of journalism, which I think most of us are probably most concerned about losing in, with, with the, with the um, crisis in, in local, local newspapers. 
Um, but it's also always struck me that that minority of people is already engaged in a, quite a lot of self-help. Um, we, we were talking a lot about here about rescuing big institutionalized journalism, but you know, not this year, but six years ago, I encountered a group of people in a small town in, in Berkshire who were running local community website um, to inform themselves about all sorts of things because they had three large local papers in their area that was simply failing to cover their community. But they, they were providing all of the, the, the sort of social glue stuff that you were talking about earlier um, for themselves. And they were organizing political campaigns around things with the county council that they weren't getting through their local papers. Um, the London Borough of Hackney has this vibrant scene of bloggers who are covering serious politics and are often coming into conflict with Hackney Gazette because they think it is so deficient in doing those things. So is, is, is the solution to um, so, uh, serving the social and political functions of journalism necessarily to be found in institutionalized journalism? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic, a good point. And, you know, one of my uh, favorite stories about that is that um, Justin Williams, who's an assistant editor at The Telegraph, and David, I forget his other name, uh, the novelist, uh, together formed a little website to save the village of Y from a huge expansion because they felt the Kent Messenger had failed to uh, put the argument properly to people and because they successfully fought against that um, development. They wrote a little book about it. Uh, and uh, I, th I think that's, that's perfectly true. I think there would have to be, in fact, if you were going to hand out this money, those kinds of tests, by the way, um, uh, to test that you would actually were carrying out the functions you would expect. Um, but I think it's always been the case, in fairness, and I think that these um, online startups, we know this from experience in the United States, are beginning to hold what they call big media to account. And in many local communities, the big media are the institutionalized um, newspapers that exist. And that kind of argument should continue, of course. So I don't, think, I don't think I'm wanting to cement in place those institutions which are failing to hold local power to account because, as I think you pointed out, they are part of that um, power structure as well, which is what you were saying, Keith. Yeah, I quite agree. And on a point of agreement, I think perhaps we will wrap this up and continue the debate um, over drinks at the bar. Um, so it just remains really for me to thank um, you all for your contributions here and specifically to thank the panel, um, William Yarker, John Slattery, Keith Sutton and Roy Greenslade. Thank you very much. Thank you.